Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about navigating your way to new import procedures for manufactured goods. Brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade in association with Digital Trader Services. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Senior Content Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for this afternoon. And thank you for joining us today. This is clearly a topic of great importance to British manufacturers. We already have coming up to 300 of you on the call, so a warm welcome to you all and a welcome to everyone else who's going to be joining a little later. If we move on to the next slide, please. As you can see, we have a panel of three very experienced and knowledgeable speakers today. Later on, we'll be hearing from Ian Clark, the Chief Technology Officer at Fujitsu, and Shankar Singham, the CEO of Trade Law and Economic Policy Consultancy Computer. But first, we'll be hearing from Kevin Shakespeare, the Director of the Institute of Export and International Trade Academy. Hi, Kevin. How are you today? How, how are things where you are? Towards the south of England, if you can remind me where you are exactly. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, actually between Crawley and Tunbridge Wells in a place called East Grinstead. So uh, it's very muggy here today. So uh, we had some uh, some big thunderstorms last night. So uh, probably expecting more soon. But uh, I'm well, and uh, it's a uh, thank you very much for everyone for attending today. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, it's also relatively muggy here in North London. But uh, as you can see, all three of our speakers are involved in the new digital trader services which we'll be hearing about later, and you can read more about their illustrious CVs in the slides, which we'll be sending out after the webinar. But if we can move to the next slide, before handing it over to Kevin, I'd just like to run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about your experience of post-Brexit trade so far. So I'm going to launch the poll, and we are asking which of these issues has been the most challenging for your business? The options you can select, for, select from are complying with rules of origin in the UK-EU trade deal, new declaration requirements for trade with the EU, supply chain delays, additional costs of trade, and a lack of access to customs expertise. And that'll be the one which has been the most challenging for your business, so select only one option. While you're answering that, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window to the right-hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions towards the end of the webinar, so please bear in mind that we have already received a lot of questions, so we will not be able to get to all of your queries today. But if you do feel that your question has not been answered, please do review some of the services we, we will be talking about throughout this webinar. Secondly, as already noted, you will receive access to today's slide back and a recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. So please do try to listen in as carefully as you can to today's presentation. Now, I'm just going to give you a couple more seconds to answer the poll. Uh, so I'll give a mini countdown of a three, two, one. I'm just going to close the poll now. So sharing the results. 30% of you have said supply chain delays are the most challenging issue you face so far this year. Uh, but that's closely followed by 25% on the new declaration requirements for trade with the EU, and 19% of you have said complying with rules of origin in the UK-EU trade deal. And before we go to the presentation, Kevin, is there any surprises in there? I mean, that supply chain delays and new declaration requirements are leading the way as to challenging issues. Yeah, again, first of all, thank you, uh, everybody, for completing the polls. And, and there's a, 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 a quite a, um, a widespread there of, of top topic so it, it probably doesn't surprise me and i guess uh, supply chain delays clearly uh, we we have the impact of covid as well as as post transition period trading so but it is interesting that there also we have declaration requirements which links in very nicely to to the presentation today because it's not just about one declaration per se it's about several declarations and and our, and obviously rules of origin clearly will be will be certainly key in, in, in a lot of sectors and, 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 and uh, paramount in manufacturing. Thanks, Kevin. Do I say all those answers are slightly interlinked in different ways, but um, interesting to see uh, how everyone has slanted there. So if we move on to the next slide, again, thank you everyone for answering those polls. Really appreciate it. Well, that's enough of me. It's time to hand over to Kevin. Over to you, Kevin. 
Thank you very much, Will, and uh, uh, good afternoon again, uh, everybody, and thank you for attending today. So it was quite interesting putting these slides together, very much uh, sort of aimed at, at the manufacturing sector and, and, and quite a number of considerations, and, and certainly working through the trade journey, as we're going to look at later, it was, it was really interesting to sort of consider that all the different facets that a business has to uh, uh, um, uh, has to undertake um, in, in 2021 trade. So we're going to look today, we're going to start with just an, an overview of manufacturing and it's important to, to the UK economy. We'll then talk around integrated manufacturing supply chains and this very much links into the, the processes for both importing and also we must consider the export process as well. Uh, and then preparations that manufacturers need to make and, and, uh, and, and, and then we, um, uh, Shankar and, and Ian will be talking around solutions and opportunities. So let's start by looking at UK manufacturing and the importance of manufacturing to the actual economy. So although in theory we could say that, that manufacturing is declining, it only counts for 10% of the UK economy and 9% of total employment, it really ignores the great benefits that manufacturing provides and increasingly this concept of manu services where many manufacturing companies are also providing services as well, where the, where, where the initial goods may be manufactured goods, but then services are then provided uh, further on, such as consultancy, um, uh, research, financing, and then the whole element of post-sale maintenance and maintaining equipment. So manufacturing is significant impact to, to the UK economy, and it's important that manufacturing businesses are supported as much as possible. So, um, and, and when we think of manufacturing, we must also think of the different types of businesses manufacturing. And we don't always think of, you know, we, we think of manufacturing as one thing in our head, but there's loads of different types of manufacturing, food and drink manufacturing, pharmaceuticals are probably two areas that we wouldn't always consider maybe went under the, the actual manufacturing element. Yes, we think about motor vehicles, chemicals, um, uh, transport, for example, but we can see the importance and that all the different types of manufacturing type businesses <clears throat> across a range of services on, 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 on screen, just showing the sheer scale, the different types of businesses and sectors, uh, subsectors involved in manufacturing. So um, also we have to think of this in terms of value chain. So um, yes, rest of the world is important, but EU value chains have, have, really, have really been established for over years. So we can see here a, a sort of balance between finished products, which, which come in by way of UK imports, and then intermediary products, and, and also with the rest of the world. So we can see here the, the number of intermediary products is um, in by percentage terms is significant. And that is very much significant in terms of post-transition period trading and the amount of movements that take place. And now let's look at it for exports. So again, we can see uh, maybe slightly higher for the rest of the world in terms of exports um, for finished products, but intermediary products to the EU is the highest category. Um, over 30% of UK exports are EU intermediary products, also very high for imports. So the level of integration in supply chains, in, in manufacturing um, uh, between the UK or Great Britain is the focus here and the European Union is significant. So this concept of the, of the integrated manufacturing, so EU manufacturing heartlands only include, uh, not the only ones, areas would be southern Germany, northern Italy and Flanders. And literally component parts can cross the English Channel several times be before they become finished goods. So it's not just maybe one finished goods, uh, uh, raw materials come into Great Britain and then finished goods are produced. They can actually crisscross the channel several times before we have to finish goods. An example would be, uh, clearly would be, that's been called out a lot, is the automotive supply chain. So it, against all this background that, that's just been provided, efficient, effective freight and customs movements are essential for the operations of these highly integrated supply chains. Also the fact um, that many businesses uh, operate or try to operate on a just-in-time basis shows the, shows the need for, for speed of movement, uh, speed of receipt of goods. 
Um, and clearly the changes in 2021 20, uh, could have an impact on profitability and margins, and we have COVID as well. So GB businesses really need as much support uh, 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 that they can get to minimize the impacts. And, and then we're gonna look at the, the actual trade journey shortly. So we've used this slide before and, and, uh, and, and just going over the changes in terms of the phased border operating model. But I just really want to call out here the significance of the 1st of January 2022. As we're going to look at the, the, the requirement for uh, frontier declarations for all goods and the requirement for safety and security declarations, and we'll also be referring to GBMS as well. So I'd like to call out there's a lot of emphasis here on the 1st of January and changes that will take place on the 1st of January. And this is not just about the customs declaration. Yes, that's significant. It's around safety and security declarations. And in some cases, as we will look at, GVMS entries as well. So significant changes that, 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 that currently some of these declarations are not required. So rule changes for EU to GB imports will impact manufacturing supply chain. We have these new declarations and everything that goes with it uh, 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 in terms of the declarations and the processes. Safety and security declarations required when goods cross borders. GVMS will need to be used for certain transport routes, so uh, not just, but notably Dover and Eurotunnel. And business must also comply with origin rules in the EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And, in, and at the beginning of next year, the current easement on supplier declaration ends as well. So other factors to consider there uh, around the whole point of rules of origin. If you're dealing in chemicals or chemical substances, you may have reach to consider as well. Um, and, and, and also we talked around the manual services concept as well, is new regulations apply for service exports and the ability to service uh, um, for someone, for example, to go from Great Britain to carry out a service to a business in the EU has been heavily uh, curtailed and sometimes requires a visa to provide that service. So we're seeing changes, uh, new, uh, a number of changes that are taking place. Some have taken place already, but some are due to take place with that notable date of the 1st of January 2022. So now let's consider uh, the sort of new import processes. And, and, and what I'm going to do is run for a seven stage process here, which really links in with, um, uh, with, uh, uh, with the impacts and what's needed. So when we think about an, the new import process, we can think about it in, 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 uh, in seven stages. Purchase, the goods are purchased from the supplier outside Great Britain. Yes, INCO terms have to be agreed as part of the negotiations. Documentation is required, paperwork, commercial invoices provided to the importer, including the actual transport details as well. And we're gonna look at a bit more about that shortly. The role of intermediaries in, 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 in this process, so likes of hauliers, agents, which will be hired uh, in some cases by both the import and by both the exporter. So we're not just talking potentially around one agent, we're possibly talking about two agents, one in the EU, one in Great Britain. Um, the requirement for declarations and also the haulier uh, to, to use the GVMS system as well. Um, and then goods are shipped to the UK and, uh, and you have a transport element. So we've, before we even get to stage five, we've got four stages before, and then we move on to the transport element. Uh, we then have the, the, the role of customs as well in this to consider. Uh, and finally, we have the delivery stage. So we can see there's a number of stages here and at each of these stages, there are, uh, there are quite a high number of factors to consider. Uh, and, 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 and businesses have to work through, but also against the concept, context that we want efficient supply chains, we want goods to move quickly, businesses to have good margins, uh, uh, to certainly maintain those margins uh, and ultimately deliver their product to market at the appropriate time. So a number of considerations here that businesses have to consider. So let's look at a case study. In this instance of a French car parts manufacturer, sell into a British car producer. So as I've indicated, important to establish INCO terms at the outset. And, and, and as you, some of you may have heard me talk about before, the INCO terms used in, uh, in trade with the EU 
can be considerably different from INCO terms used for trade with the rest of the world. Uh, and clearly under INCO terms 2020, we now have 11 INCO terms, well, we still have 11 INCO terms, but we have a few changes to the INCO terms. Uh, but in this instance, the French manufacturer uses DAP, delivered at place. And you can see on the slide that currently they're supplying on DDP delivered duty pay terms, or previously they were supplying. So if you if you are, uh, it's very important for you in if, if you are the UK importer, for example, GB importer in this case, to be clear on what your INCO terms are. If the lorry turns up at your premises, what is the INCO term? Who is going to be responsible going forward for the import formalities, the import documentation? Is it clear? Because previously, prior to 2021, uh, we didn't always think about INCO terms in the context of EU to GB trade. But in this instance, we're going to say DAP delivered at place. So this transaction is moving at delivered at place, which will probably be one of the, uh, probably be in the majority in terms of the INCO terms used. Yes, X works, or yes, more particularly FCA uh, 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 may apply free carrier, and I guess deliver duty pay could supply in, in some instances, but DAP will be a, a very popular INCO term. So let's start with the documentation stage here. So um, uh, the French manufacturer sends a commercial invoice to the GB buyer, and it, clearly that must have essential information. And, and, and it comes back to the role of the commercial invoice. That it is, yes, a, if you like, a demand for payment. So it, it, will, it will state the price, the payment terms, but it also has a key role in terms of customs as well. So key information is required there. And when we think about customs purposes, the commodity codes, the country of origin uh, become really important as well, as well as the INCO terms and, and, and then the PO number, purchase order number and, and, and bank account details, etc. So um, we have a number of factors to consider there. And also the, the, the requirement for two EORI numbers under delivered at place, DAP. The French manage, uh, manufacturer require an EU FR uh, EORI number, and, and the GB firm's EORI number will start with GB. So, yes, we yeah, would expect most businesses to have EORI numbers, uh, but if your French manufacturer has never exported before, uh, let's say, uh, they, would, uh, they would have needed to, to obtain their, their, if you like, EU FR EORI number. So, documentation stage. And at that stage, the GB buyer may also want to consider using postponed VAT accounting, PVA, uh, as well. So then we have the role of intermediaries. So the French manufacturer, in this case, engages the services of a European haulier to transport the goods. And the European haulier must ensure they have the necessary license and permits, permits required for international road haulage. And, and, and in this case, they also engage the services of a customs agent. Yes, it is possible to use uh, to use the likes of, of, of freight forwarders who, who may carry out both roles. But, um, but in this case, it's a haulier, and, and it applies in, in quite a number of cases, will engage the services of customs agents. So we're talking about two, two different roles here in this regard. So the GB buyer in this case, when purchasing, uh, will need to establish their own customs agent because under DAP, delivered at place, the responsibility for the import declaration in Great Britain will be the responsibility of the UK importer. So once they've identified uh, a, a customs agent, they need to select postponed VAT on the import declaration. That's assuming they use postponed VAT accounting, but that's a positive action that needs to be taken. So, uh, moving on, on to the actual declarations piece itself. So, the French manufacturer and GB buyer provide invoices to their respective customs agents because they need that information or they need data to, 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 to actually make the customs declaration. So, we can see here, we, in this instance, uh, in a standard journey, we're talking about invoices, we're talking about data sets as well. So again, the information must include commodity codes, origin, valuation, and transport information as well. And some customs agents may also require a packing list as, as well. Clearly, gross weight, net weight requirements need to be provided as well. They can be provided in, 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 in the data provided, but some customs agents may also require a packing list. 
So uh, other factors to consider here. So the commercial invoice um, re uh, effectively requires a statement of origin from the French manufacturer show the goods are of EU origin. So under the EU trade, uh, EU uh, UK trade and cooperation agreement, we're working on the basis of statements of origin rather than formal certificates of origin. So there needs to be that statement of origin on the commercial invoice that the goods are, are of EU origin. That is, of course, uh, uh, assuming they are of EU origin in this case. The GB buyer, however, must demonstrate importer's knowledge. And, and again, th th this is an area where we can think about, well, you've got the immediacy of getting the goods over the border, but what happens on customs audit in two or three years' time? More auditing going forward will focus on the origin of the goods, where maybe it hasn't been one of the key elements of an audit. Uh, clearly, it will become more and more important. So a GB uh, buyer must demonstrate that importer's knowledge. How do they know those goods are of EU origin? Well, yeah, OK, we could argue that the French manufacturers put that statement of origin, but do they actually know that they are of EU origin? So they may require a supplier's declaration from the French manufacturer which again is, 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 is additional information. So they've got a, a, a declaration from the French manufacturer saying that it is of EU origin. So then we move on to the actual declarations piece. So we can see here there's quite a bit of work before we even get to that stage. So uh, a number of things here, but I guess I guess the factor is, is that uh, is that if business is not used to having to do this because you haven't traded with the rest of the world, these are all factors to consider um, and, and work to consider. So there are, if you like, benefits in, in trying, to, uh, trying to trade also with the rest of the world in both supply chains and exporting as well. But we also have the additional element of GVMS, which we're going to look at as well. So declarations submitted. So in this instance, the, the European haulier travels to the DAP location, so on the way. They are required to register for GVMS, and, and GVMS links all the customs references into one record, referred to as a goods movement reference, GV, uh, G, GMR. So it applies for imports, movements not just over in Eurotunnel, uh, but uh, in, 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 in this instance, this is the route that's used. Uh, and then we have um, uh, the actual declaration requirement side to consider. So we've, had, we've, we've, we've looked at GVMS, so now we're going to look at the actual declarations requirement. So the French customs agent whose services have been engaged here submits their export declaration through the French customs system Delta G. And by submitting that export declaration, they also meet the exit safety and security requirements for France as well. And again, since the 1st of January, we have this additional element of safety and security declarations. It's not just a customs declaration. And that generates an MRN, uh, a movement reference number. So suddenly we're starting to bring into play a safety and security declaration and a GVMS in addition to the customs declaration. Not entirely, um, uh, so safety and security declarations obviously apply worldwide um, under, the, under the WCO rules, World Customs Organization rules, but we, we've also got this added element of GVMS. So we haven't finished on declarations yet. The GB buyer needs to instruct their customs agent, who they've engaged, to submit an import customs declaration. The customs agent also requires to submit an entry safety and security declaration. But for them to do that, they need the MRN from the haulier, the movement reference number. So there needs to be good engagement and interlinking there. Um, and then the haulage company accesses the GVMS um, to insert the relevant declaration references with the goods movement reference for the vehicle movement. So the haulier has work to do, the customs agents have work to do in our scenario. So the haulier drives to the French port, so for example Calais, and checks in with the carrier, the ferry operator, where they need to scan the relevant documentation, and that includes the GMR, the goods movement reference. So these are changes obviously which have occurred um, uh, and, and are arising. So we, we, we're, um, we, we're now on to the transport element. We've gone through an awful lot before we've got to the actual transport element. So if everything is in order, the haulier proceeds to that uh, allotted lane to board the ferry. Um, uh, after the ferry departs, 
uh, the ferry operator notifies the UK customs system through GVMS. So, and then a risk assessment is carried out uh, if any checks need to be made on arrival and the driver looks up their vehicle to see if any checks are required. And then we move on to delivery. Suddenly we've had all these stages that, that didn't exist before, which businesses now have to, have to work with. So if everything is in order, the goods are cleared, customs cleared, with the GB customs agent advised. And the haulier delivers the goods to the DAP location. Uh, and, and then the GB uh, buyer is advised the amount of import VAT that is due on their online VAT statements, uh, postponed via, via accounting if that applies, and will account for the import VAT on their next VAT return. So the goods have now finally entered free circulation and are ready for sale. So key learnings, as we can see, this has been quite a, a long journey in terms of uh, different elements. Who are the key stakeholders? The French supplier, the GB buyer, the haulier, the carrier, the French customs agent, the GB customs agent. And we've not even discussed other areas that businesses have to consider. We've not even considered transit in this. Okay, it's come from France, but what happens if it's not come from France? Or the benefits of using customs special procedures potentially, uh, depending obviously on, on, on final sale and things like that. The possibility of or in interaction of returns goods relief um, could apply. Uh, the implication of origins on tariffs, which I've loosely referred to in the rules of origin. The requirements for controls and licenses on certain goods. And then clearly for excise duty and procedures, further, uh, further requirements as well potentially. So at this stage, I will now pass back for a poll. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. So far, really interesting. And as um, many of you have requested, actually, that we did this for a case study. So um, hopefully that's been useful for everyone. So this poll uh, will actually be a bit of a Kevin talk over on this, but the poll is going to ask you uh, which of the following custom simplifications would or could most help your business trade more effectively? And I think, Kevin, you're going to talk over the options here. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So would you just like to read the options first of all, Will, and then I'll talk over them. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, so EIDR on a permanent basis, reduced declaration data sets, a greater use of oral declarations, OCR document recognition and single window document upload. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much again uh, for that, Will. So uh, I, I, I guess what we're looking at here is uh, clearly a lot of work is taking place currently on border 2025 in the UK, but a lot of work is taking place globally on trade facilitation and, 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 and uh, we could call them easements, uh, simplifications. So EIDR is the concept of entry into declarants records. So currently to make a simplified declaration, uh, uh, CFSP, Customs Freight Simplified Procedures is required. Uh, but could we introduce this concept of uh, uh, EI EIDR on a, on a more permanent basis? Clearly, it applies already for the phase border operating model. Then the concept of reduced data sets. Now, clearly, safety and security and supply chains are important. But if, if there is reduced data sets required, could that actually help businesses um, in, uh, in, in, in how they trade? And um, Will, apologies, so I'll just check the third one again. Third one was greater use of oral declarations. Yeah, great. So oral declarations, uh, I guess, uh, declarations by conduct. Again, um, they, 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 they may be used in certain circumstances, but is there potential to use more uh, oral declarations? Then OCR, optical character recognition. I know some work is taking place in this regard currently. Um, would that help businesses as well? And then finally, and, and, and I appreciate the last one's probably a bit more detailed, is the concept of single window. So to upload all your documents into one file, one single window, uh, where systems talk to each other. So if it's, for example, uh, health certificates, so it becomes more automated. And the reason we're asking this, and, and, and uh, many of you will have done this, is we've had a major, uh, and thank you for everyone who's responded to what, what future borders will look like and what businesses actually want. So your feedback to this uh, is really interesting and we're really looking forward to it. So thank you very much and we'll await the poll results. 
Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'll give people a few more seconds to absorb all of that and to respond. So I'll just do a couple very quick questions. Uh, we had a question in from Leanne who's asked, with postponed VAT account accounting, is it just the VAT that is deferred or is it the VAT and the duty? Excuse me. So yes, um, good question. So it is just a, P a postponed VAT account in PVA is just a VAT element. It is possible to defer the duty if if if, if duty arises um, through through a duty deferment account. Now there are some circumstances where your duty uh, uh, deferment account no longer requires a financial guarantee. But if you are if any any business that's defined as a high risk trader. Uh, will require a financial guarantee, but there may be a requirement to have that sort of waiver or easement on that guarantee if you're not a high risk trader. I would stress though that uh, for imports or duty over £10,000, there, there are additional uh, compliance and disclosure requirements which, uh, which are slightly more onerous on a company to, 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 to let's say avoid the use of that financial guarantee. Thanks, Kevin. I'm going to do one more now. Uh, we've had a question in, a couple of questions on statement of origins. Ellen's asked, is the statement required if the UK global tariff uh, duty uh, set is 0%? And Andre has asked, is the statement of origin on the invoice for imported goods limited up to a goods value? Uh, so the, the actual statement of origin should be on every invoice. And, and, and what, what I actually should have said, it's not just a commercial invoice, it would be good practice to put it on pro forma invoices on quotations as well. So good practice putting all your documents. In the case of the uh, the EU GB, uh, UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, it, it specifically calls for it uh, there and it's specifically to do with preferential origin. We're not necessarily talking about non-preferential origin here and, and, and the rules of origin that apply in that case, but I think it's also important to demonstrate the origin and have knowledge of it to make sure that goods have ultimately not started off from, a, from an embargoed country, albeit that is more, more applicable to non-preferential origin. So it is, it is good practice and it should be used for every transaction, uh, irrespective of amount, uh, irrespective of whether there's any, any duties, because we, we, we must remember that some goods could have things like anti-dumping duties, ADD added to it, and, and, and the world in which we know it today, things can change in, in terms of sanctioned embargoed countries as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And just a quick note to everyone who's putting in questions. Fantastic questions coming through. Uh, just a tip, though, the more concise the questions, the easier it is for me to read them. So um, please do try to, to keep it as short as possible. Um, I'm going to close the poll and share the results. So interestingly, 51% of you has said, have gone for the single window document upload. 23% of you have said reduced declaration data sets and that's followed by 15% of you saying EIDR on a permanent basis. Any surprises there, Kevin? So again, uh, thank you very much indeed for, for everyone. It, it really, really great feedback. Um, I, I think, as you say, that the, the concept of single window is, is we don't always, it, it's coming more in our terminology, and I appreciate we might have some, some, some very experienced uh, 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 individuals um, on, the, on the call today. But when, when we do work in Africa and around the world, uh, we've done work in New Zealand recently, the concept of single window is embedded in the psyche and culture of, of traders, uh, businesses, hauliers, carriers in other parts of the world. So it, it's a really it's really valuable feedback. The reduced data sets is a really interesting one as well. So opportunities for the UK under the likes of not just AEO, but mutual recognition schemes. And the, the EIDR one was probably a little bit higher than what, what, what I expected, but I think that's quite an interesting one as well. So thank you again, everyone. I think that's that's really, really helpful. Thank you. So, Thanks, Kevin, and I, yeah, sorry, I'll hide the poll first, Kevin, and uh, I'll let you re return to presentation. Thank you, thank you. So, um, I'm just going to sum up now a few things in how businesses, carriers, and intermediaries can prepare. So, ensure the commercial invoice have all the required details. Get clarity on your INCO terms. Uh, make sure you have the correct commodity code, origin, and valuation for your goods. Uh, know the gross and, and net weight of the goods. Uh, engage with a reliable haulier who is registered to use GVMS. Use reliable customs agents. Also, can submit safety and security declarations. 
understand the requirements for placing goods on the UK EU market, so the likes of the UK CA, I know that's been uh, uh, put back to 1st of January 2023 in terms of introduction, but also the CE market. In some cases, the requirement for an actual EU rep now uh, uh, for the CE market. Reach regulations if applicable and ensure clearly any wooden packaging, especially heat treated under ISPM 15 regulations. And then further things for MANO services. Bear in mind different rules uh, in terms of visa requirements, tr business travel to the EU, carrying out a service apply for different EU member states uh, and potential restrictions when you're providing a B2B service and the ability to actually travel without obtaining a visa. So for example, for repair or maintenance, recognition of professional qualifications, which in some sectors, but across sectors, is an absolutely fundamental requirement and different requirements for different EU member states. So at this stage, I'm going to pass to, to Shanko and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Kevin. And if we can go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit now about um, about what the market is doing in response to all of the things that that, that Kevin sort of highlighted uh, there. So um, typically, what would happen, um, and what has happened in in the past in, in terms of customs um, processes, is um, intermediaries uh, get involved at the at the third stage there will be doing declarations handling the transport arrangements and dealing with customs uh, uh, on behalf of their uh, of their clients uh, and their customers um, uh, they'll also be providing general advice and guidance to their, their um, to their customers and clients and that's been the historic way that things um, things have been done. Now, with respect to the changes to the UK border and the border operating model in particular, uh, we, we've sort of identified some key challenges to the sort of way things that have been um, done in the past. And, and if we look at what those challenges are, um, the, the, the new declaration requirements, obviously that, and that was identified earlier on in the, in the poll as being a particular issue. Um, as of the 1st of January 2022, uh, you will be required to do frontier declaration. So you're moving from the EIDR to supplementary declaration easement into a requirement for frontier declarations. Uh, and that will be required for all goods entering GB from uh, the EU. Um, uh, and you've got the the, the easement um, on a rolling basis available until December. Although we should point out, as we've done in previous um, sessions, that there's a 175 day period there. So if your products have come in under EIDR at the beginning of the year, you've got 175 days to do the supplementary declaration. The the easement extension does not mean that you suddenly have until the end of the year to worry about um, the supplementary declaration. That's not the case. Uh, 175 day period still applies. So that that is um, the um, the requirement there. Um, the second uh, issue is that um, uh, this 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 all may cost people, um, and uh, sometimes these expenses and the requirements are you know can be can be quite expensive and that's tied to the third challenge that we've identified which is that um if we can put the third challenge up there um which is the um obviously there's a lot of declarations that are going to suddenly be required you know when you when you move out of a customs union as the uk uh, has done uh, that suddenly requires a lot of declarations and the um, market um, is not necessarily going to be able to handle um, that high demand. And we've certainly identified many, many cases where people are essentially saying, well, we can't find an intermediary or intermediaries are essentially saying that we are um, um, we don't have any any capacity uh, or conversely, what, what you'd expect to happen when there's a high demand and a limited supply of the services, the prices are going to go up and, and those prices uh, we have detected um, have have gone up quite substantially, or are going up quite substantially, uh, including in some cases as much as you know multiple fold um, uh, uh, the, the level of price pricing. And I think just going back to number one uh, on the declaration requirement piece, it was very interesting to see the poll actually um, earlier on that 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 people had identified supply chain delays being a, a real issue. 
um, while you are required to have frontier declarations from the 1st of January. I think it's going to be very, very important, uh, and I'm not sure this is sort of well understood. Um, uh, when you look at all the things that Kevin raised at the, uh, at the early part of the presentation about the way goods are actually going to move and the connection between things like the GVMS system and the requirements of declarations, this is going to put an enormous amount of pressure potentially on the frontier itself, on, on, the, on the border between the EU and, and GB. Uh, and anything I think that we can do to lower the pressure on the frontier is going to be very helpful, including using things like the simplified process, simplified frontier declarations to subdex, not for the six month period of, of the easement, but um, you know, a, a, a supplementary declaration that follows um, sometime within that window of fourth day, you know, fourth working day uh, of the month following the month of the movement. Um, uh, but just to take the pressure off the, uh, off the frontier, I think that's going to become quite, uh, quite important. And as I say, I don't think that's been fully fully recognized so 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 these are some of the issues um that and some of the challenges that, that that we've detected and as a result of that you know we have put together you know a solution which uh, my colleague ian uh, clark from fujitsu is going to is now going to walk you through thank you shanker and uh, and, and thank you kevin before that i've i've got to say i worked I work with technology for, for quite a, a number of years and with um, borders and trade for, for, for the most recent few of those years. And I look at the kind of process that Kevin's just described there, and it still amazes me that anything ever gets to move across a border. Um, and, and, and sort of with, with some of that thought in mind, um, we looked, as Shank has just described, of how we, how, how we start to be able to help with, you know, some of the things that are happening this year in 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 terms of the easement for for the movement of goods and and some of the the uh, additional uh, steps that will need to take place in as you've seen in the, in the process today um Kevin if you wouldn't mind just putting the rest of the uh, the, the slide content on there thank you so so what, what we've looked at sort of fits in, in into a number of of areas it's it, it's understanding uh, the process, understanding the obligations, um, and, and we've looked at how we can provide help in in those areas. So making it easy to understand what um, you know what you what you do need to do. Um, not also you know not, not only today, but 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 have those change. And also as we've we, we've seen in the poll there to look at the data. Um, you know if you if you look at that that summary process of agreeing to purchase some goods, you know, we're starting for a point where there might be a quotation or, a, or, or, or an, online, an online order. We've, we've got some information about the goods. Um, how can we use that data consistently throughout the process? So we've looked at, we've looked at things, things along those lines. Now, how do we make it easy to understand um, what's needed at each point? Uh, I'm, I'm sure the, those of you who've, who've touched customs a few times you know know much more than i do the complexity that that you know that that brings um so so what we do within the service and what we do within within our platform is is try wherever we possibly can um to ask questions which 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 are business questions so you know kevin told us a little bit about uh inco terms um earlier on so we'll you know we'll ask questions about you know who's who's paying for each of the each each of the elements so who paid for delivery who paid for insurance etc so we try to you know we try to tease out that inco term answer without without saying what income term did you use so there's a few things there where we where we try and bring that out use some of the data that hmrc published so again those of you that have been into and seen the hmrc tariff once you understand how to how how, how to work through it you can you can find the answers to to your questions um but that's that information you know you need to know how to drive it um so what we're also doing is we as we ask questions about about goods in a, in our platform um we'll bring information and questions from the tariff so look at some of the information that sits behind the commodity code and ask you a set of pertinent questions to the to the particular commodity that you're um that, that you're moving so a mix of that um, expertise 
guidance um, and, and, and also the ability to, to simply um, share data and also to um, submit those, those, those declarations um, without needing the kind of um, authorizations um, and, and software um, that's, that's that involved. So in other words, putting that control in, in, in your hands. Um, as you can see from the, uh, the, the, the URL there, um, this, this, the service is up and running and available. Um, you can create a free account at digitaltraderservices.com um, on the, uh, on the as, as, as you can see on the, uh, the URL at the bottom there. Um, so if we could move to the next slide, please, Kevin, just sort of wrap up on, on, on that part and leave a, leave a little bit of time, a little bit of time for, for, for questions. Um, so what you see on the on the on the left hand side here is an example of our process from our from our web portal. Um, as I mentioned before, you can you can sign up for for a free, free account today. Um, once you've signed up to that free account, you can subscribe to one of the um, one of the different levels of subscription. Uh, and what you'll see on the left hand side is is a screen from our from our um, supplementary declaration submission process. And what I've, what I've done in here is make a make a deliberate mistake. Um, so what that process does, it just takes you through a set of questions, um, asks you your business questions about you know the goods uh, that moved, where they moved from, where they moved to, uh, asks you obviously things about about commodity codes, and then at the end of the the end of the process. Uh, it does a check of what you've what what you've done, so you can see it sort of split into those those four areas. Um, I, I obviously left something out of the uh, the last section there, but it tells me that. So I'm not going to then you know hit submit and hope it's all okay and get some bad news a little bit a, a little bit later on. Uh, it tells me that there's something I need to go back and do. And obviously in the in the real system, you can you can click on that link, go and make those changes. Um, and then, uh, and 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 then your your data will be in a much much better position. So all about that 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 quality of data, helping you capture that data, helping you um, share share data, um, and and use the data that is that is shared with you. Um, and and if there is a problem in, in any of that process, um, we're there to capture that as well. So, so if there is a problem with a with a declaration, um, one of our customs experts will will uh, be notified of that automatically. Uh, if it's something we'll resolve that we can resolve, we'll resolve it. If it's a system issue, for for example, or if it's something where we need to talk to you, we'll come back and talk to you. So, so you can you, you know once you've hit submit there, um, it's either going to go through and the system will tell you it's gone through, or um, or, or, or we'll come back to you, and we'll um, we'll make sure that the, the declaration gets submitted. So, in other words, putting that 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 control in, into your hands. Um, so we've we, we've started this service based on the uh, the easement that was described a little bit earlier for the import of goods from the EU in, into Great Britain. Uh, we're now expanding the capability. Um, to look at the look at the goods movement process uh, effectively, so 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 for, for 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 the movement of goods from a supplier um, to their customer um, via the, via the haulier or the or the freight forwarder, how do we best support that process? So there's a there's a clear set of of accurate data that supports all of those those steps in the process, um, with the aims obviously to to avoid the potential delays and 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 to put Put the control of those those costs in uh, in your hands rather than, um, than than necessarily relying on what we've seen in some instances, as Shankar mentioned, some of the, uh, the the potentially spiraling costs. So that's all from me. Thank you. I'll uh, hand back to Kevin. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. So uh, just just to conclude the slide, so I'm very conscious we want to get on to questions now. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, is, is there is a combined Institute of Export and International Trade DTS package, and these slides will, will be made uh, uh, available to you. Depending um, uh, on, on the service taken, there's a potentially a 15% discount on uh, membership of the Institute. The Institute as a whole um, uh, 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 provide a high number of services, 
and but certainly fine from our from our members, which which has increased uh, in, increased uh, significantly. Uh, that things like the technical uh, help desk helplines that we that we'll be introducing, uh, our training and education programs are very very important as well as our daily bulletin. Um, so just about the institute, we now have over five thousand members and we provide real-time qualified business advice. So the help desk, helpline uh, concept, networking opportunities, uh, and also representation to, to government. So, uh, and thank you for your feedback to the poll question today on, 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 on future strategy. That sort of information is really, really important. So um, on that note, I'm going to pass to uh, back to Will. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks also to Ian and uh, Shanko as well. Really useful presentations, and great to hear more about DTS as well. Really a useful solution, it seems. But, and I'm actually going to ask a quick poll just as we get into the Q&A, asking you if you would like to, to, have, to get more information about DTS, uh, as noted by Ian. It's a really, really great opportunity for people to get control of the, the new requirements which are coming their way um, as it starts next year. So just while people are answering that poll, I've had a We've had loads of questions in, we won't be able to get to all of them, but I'm going to start with one from Susan. I'll put this uh, to, to Ian, then Shankar may want to come in as well. But Susan has asked, can the digital trader service be used even if you're using a fast parcel operator? So, so I think I think we'd need to understand a little bit more about the the details, and and I'm sure one of our one of our, one of our colleagues, if you if you look on the website, there's a there's a contact number there. One of our one of our colleagues would be able to talk you through that process. Um, it so it depends on the way that they on the interaction with the fast parcel operator, but I think it would be it would be difficult to give a blanket sort of yes or no um, without understanding the details. Yeah, just to just to build on that, the the, the sort of DTS has various bills that, that Ian um, alluded to, um, and the initial one is dealing with the easement and the uh, the backlog of supplementary declarations that have been built up by traders who've been doing EIDR. Uh, and when we say they've been doing EIDR, what's clear is that uh, in some cases you're talking about you know d-ring folders full of invoices um so so there's quite a lot of getting that data in a format where it can actually where a supplementary declaration can be done is quite complex or, or maybe quite difficult so we got that and then we got the full frontier declaration and the and the sfd to sub deck process um now in terms of um how the goods are actually moving um, clearly, any 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 movement which requires the importer to do um, the customs declaration certainly support. But we, we'd want to talk to you about exactly how that movement you know works, so we can identify the best DTS service um, uh, for you, and 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 when that sort of comes on stream. As, as, as noted in the presentation, DTS does provide uh, advice and support for traders uh, regardless of their scenario. So um, that's one of the one of the benefits of the of the service. Uh, we'll do another question on DTS. That's why we've got this poll open. Uh, Helena has asked: We already work with a customs intermediary. Why should we use the digital trader service? I don't know, Shank, if you want to start on that one, and then Ian may want to come in, or, or Kevin. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, very good question. Um, I, I, I think the when you look at DTS and, and and we really built built the service, you know, on the back of what we saw as the major challenges that I outlined in the market and the very specific things associated with the um, the lack of intermediary um, uh, function and the um, cost and so forth. So I think there are two there were two principal gaps that we that we thought we needed to fill. The the first was the real requirement for a very simple front end, a very simple um, portal interface, uh, digital first way of doing this, so that people did not have to essentially become customs experts in order to um, in order to interact with the process. Sort of uh, very much in line with HMRC's trajectory, which is towards greater self service. Uh, and that's also, by the way, in line with HMRC's general tax um, ap approach as well, um, which I think you know we need to align the, the, all of these different processes. So we wanted to do something that anyone could could really do. Anyone could sort of plug in the information or answer the questions in the portal. So there's that aspect of it, which I think we 
we have produced something that is some is, is somewhat game changing in that respect. And then the other aspect where there was a great deal of a lack of knowledge was the uh, or lack of uh, understanding was was the the lack of education support and the need to educate you know a, a vast amount of traders in 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 GB. Um, and I say GB because obviously there are different arrangements for GB and I, which you know um, many of you will know us from the Trader Support Service, and we cover that you know for for GB and I. But EU GB, a, a lack of knowledge and and the need for very high level customs expertise, and that's why we're you know happy to partner with with IOE and. Um, and we also have additional customs expertise, legal customs expertise. So there's a there's a one stop shop basically for all of that. Um, you know, we have customs lawyers. I am a customs and trade lawyer. Um, you know, we have a lot of resources, and that was a, a, another gap. And I guess the final gap was um, you've got a very very fluid situation here. So so understanding, and Kevin, you know, uh, alluded to this at the beginning. Really understanding. Uh, it seems sometimes like you need a crystal ball in, in order to figure out what the UK's border is going to look like in the next, you know, um, months uh, or, or even weeks. Um, but but being being in the flow of that information and being in the flow of what the government approaches to some of these things and why um, you know why it's approaching things in that way is really really important. And of course we have that um, we have that base sort of covered as as well. So those are the three sort of principal things where we certainly we would think we have a, a, a unique sort of selling selling point. Great, uh, great. Thank you, Shankar. That's a, that a really very far answer. So thank you so much. I hope that's been helpful, uh, Helena. I'm just going to close the poll, and uh, as you'll see on the next slide, we are very much, very much in the Q and A, and we'll we'll do a, couple, a few more questions. Uh, so if we move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, this is a question picking up on, I mean, really the, the nuts and bolts of your presentation, Kevin. It's from Ali, and it's, it's a great chance to clarify um, the process, really. So he's asked, or, or she. Um, forgive me either way. Uh, it, at what stage of the process does the, does the UK import or agent have to submit the import declaration? Yeah, so it's a good question. I think from the, uh, from the um, clearly we have this potential easement at the moment with, uh, uh, with 175 days after date of import, but from the 1st of January next year that import declaration will be required before the goods uh, are, are, are allowed to enter the United Kingdom. So an import declaration of some sort is needed. Now it could be a simplified declaration uh, and it's imp also important to point out that we have the safety and security declaration to consider as well as the customs declaration. And if it's going through, for example, the likes of, uh, of Eurotunnel and, uh, and uh, Calais Dover, we also have the GVMS entry to consider as well. So we have a number of considerations, but everything sort of changes at the border from the 1st of January next year. Thanks, Kevin. We've had a few people asking about the UK CA mark. So I just wonder, we, we touched on it earlier, but obviously this is a manufacturer's webinar. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about when that's now going to be required, what does that mean for traders and what the process may be around UK CA marks? Yeah, so the, the 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 government announced fairly recently, and and it was probably to do with uh, a potential uh, uh, need for more conformity assessment organisations and individuals to to actually provide the conformity assessment. That there would be a a move in from use of the CA mark from the first of January 2022 to the 1st of January 2023, so it was put back a year. But that doesn't mean that businesses should, should, should just leave it. They should, they should still be looking to try and get the UK CA mark in as soon as is feasible. We do appreciate in, in some sectors that there are, there are uh, uh, potentially a lack of supply in terms of getting that UK, UK CA mark in. But like a lot of things, it is important um, uh, to, to actually try and achieve it as soon as possible. And, and clearly, that also applies to UK CA market, applies for placing goods on the UK market. So European businesses have to consider use of that, uh, that CA market as well. Thanks, Kevin. And we've got time for one last question. It's going to go back to DTS. Uh, this is from Niraj, who's asked, are the costs for DTS based on a per declaration basis or on a monthly subscription basis? Uh, Ian, do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, and, and interestingly, the answer is yes, both. 
Um, so, so there are four packages available at, at the moment. Uh, the charging basis is is per declaration, so it's really clear what, what you're paying. Um, as you increase your volume of, 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 of declarations, where the some of the some of the additional packages for for a monthly charge reduce your um, reduce your per declaration charge. So obviously you can you can fairly quickly work out. You know, if I do a hundred declarations a month or a thousand declarations a month, which is the cheapest package, um, and that's all shown on the uh, on the on the website. So you can see our uh, our, our pricing model on there. Thanks, Ian. And if we move to the next slide, uh, I believe the final slide does have that URL for the website. Uh, so please do, if you're interested in DTS, uh, Digital Trader Services, do go to the website. The contact details are there as well. Um, so please do avail of, of the information which is online uh, to find out more. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to wrap up today's session today. Thank you, everyone. So many questions have come through, and we will definitely be having a look at uh, the questions in the round following this webinar. But thank you once again to Kevin, Shankar, and Ian for your advice and time today. I hope everyone has found this session really useful. Just a reminder that we will be sending all registrants uh, to today's webinar a recording as well as the slides, uh, hopefully tomorrow morning. But for now, thank you, everyone, for joining. Sorry to slightly overrun, but please do let us know your thoughts on in the exit survey and goodbye for now. See you on the next one. Thanks everyone.